years off our children's lives by increasing their exposure to contaminants in the air and water. The Republicans are putting polluters ahead of the health and safety of the American people. I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill. What purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Strike the last section. The gentleman recognized for five minutes. Okay. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, when some of us go home and we speak to different groups about how Congress conducts its business, one of the uh, parts of those conversations that may be hard to understand is that we have personal relationships and we have people on both sides of the aisle that we respect and we like. And so, especially during these times, it becomes difficult for some of us when, for instance, a person like myself looks at a Chairman Rogers or a Chairman Wolf or a Mike Simpson, Chairman Simpson, and we know that these are good people who are totally confused as to what it is we're supposed to be doing. You say to a Republican these days, good morning, and he or she answers, cut the budget. The sky is blue, cut the budget. We all understand the need to get certain amounts of spending under control. But the problem is that some folks, and this bill shows that, continue to totally misunderstand that, yes, we may have economic issues that we have to deal with. That's a given. But we are also still, and perhaps forever, the greatest country on earth. How did we get there? We didn't get there because we decided every couple of years to simply cut the budget. We got there because we invested money, because we created, yes, rules, because we created, yes, laws that protected our way of life and the way that we wanted our future generations to be treated. And so what you see across the board now is this belief that if you get the budget down to a certain number, which sometimes, and I say this profoundly sarcastic perhaps, some people would like to get it to a zero, and I don't know what happens constitutionally after that if the budget is at zero, but if you get it down, then the country will do better. Everything will be well. Couple that with the fact that while some folks on that side are in fact strong believers that you must cut spending, others have taken the opportunity to roll back language, to roll back regulations that have made the environment safer, that have made our lives better, that have made us safer as Americans. And so the public is being told it's about cutting the budget. The public is being told it's about not having a national debt. The public is being told it's about the future of our country in terms of what we owe. Yes, that is a legitimate concern. But what the country is not being told is that, for instance, in this bill, through writers, we are going back, perhaps not even to the 60s, but to the 50s or even the 40s in, in environmental issues, on environmental issues and other issues. And so what we need to do is to continue to be a voice on this side and folks on that side who believe, as I do, that this is the wrong route to take, that we have to continue to stand up and say we all understand the need to address the issues we have to, but we can't throw away everything that we've had. We can't throw away everything we've built. We can't simply not invest in the future. I sit on other committees, committees that have traditionally given us an opportunity to invest. Somewhere right now in this country, there is a person, male or female, sitting with a white robe in a laboratory coming up with the next medicine, the next Velcro, if you will, the next invention that will make us a better nation and a better society and help ourselves and help the world. If you look at those budgets, and they'll be coming to a floor near you pretty soon, 
those budgets are devastated when it comes to investing money in research. And so while it's good to tell the public, cut the budget, we need to be honest and say in the process, we may set you back 30 or 40 years. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? Gentleman recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill, H.R. 2584, is a terrible bill. It's a terrible bill for our country, and it represents an assault on our environment. And actually, I was looking through the various assessments about this bill, this interior and environment appropriations legislation for 2012 from different advocacy groups out there that are concerned about the environment, concerned about clean air and clean water. And that's the word they kept using, assault. This is an assault on clean water. It's an assault on clean air. It's an assault on conservation. It continues the assault that was begun at the beginning of this year with H.R. 1 to completely dismantle our environmental protections. And I confess to you, I just don't understand the motivations of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Do we not breathe the same air? Do we not drink the same water? Do we not traverse the same beautiful terrain across this country? I can't imagine, I can't fathom what the motivation is to engage in this wholesale attack on our environment. Let's look at that attack. They're proposing to cut the EPA's budget this is the agency that is charged with protecting our environment. To cut that budget by 18 percent below 2011 levels and by 40 percent below 2010 levels. I come from the Chesapeake Bay. I grew up fishing for crabs in the Nanticoke River on the eastern shore of Maryland. My grandmother lived in Salisbury. That's where we used to go during the summers. This would be devastating for the Chesapeake Bay. It cuts funding to the Chesapeake Bay program, which is designed to put the bay on a pollution diet so we can clean up the Chesapeake Bay. But this would undermine that. And it puts all these policy riders on. It's loaded up with policy riders. It would prevent the regulation of coal ash as a hazardous waste. Well, we have that issue in my district regulating coal ash. I want the Environmental Protection Agency to be able to do that work. But this bill would undermine it. So it's an assault on clean water, and that affects the Chesapeake Bay. But let's look at what else it does. It's an assault on clean air. This bill, with all of these policy riders, would block standards to cut air pollution from cement kilns and delaying standards for power plants by six months that would do what? They would reduce mercury, arsenic, and lead in the air. Don't we want to do that? So why would we undermine that effort? It would exempt oil companies. Now, this is no surprise. That's become a common practice. How many exemptions can we give to the oil and gas industry? Well, here's another one. It would exempt oil companies from complying with the Clean Air Act in offshore drilling operations. It's an assault on clean air. And you know what? A study was done by the EPA that said the air quality improvements under the Clean Air Act, if maintained for the period from 1990 to 2020, will result in $2 trillion in savings for this country and prevent 230,000 deaths. So why would you want to undermine the protections with respect to our clean air? It's an assault on environmental education taking funding away from the National Park Service in terms of needed construction that has to be done. It's an assault on our national wildlife refuges. The reduction in funding 
for our national wildlife refugees would result in 140 of them being closed. That's 25 percent of them across the country. It's an assault on conservation, reducing the Land and Water Conservation Fund to a 45-year low of $66 million. That's an 80 percent cut from 2011 levels. But here's the great shame of it. The great shame of it is the American people are ready to step up and be stewards of the environment. They want to do that. They want to take ownership in their own backyards. But they can't do it if the federal government isn't there as a part. The gentleman's I urge time is expired. Of this bill and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The American public was concerned mainly about two things in this last election. A, jobs. Trying to get opportunities for themselves and their children and young people to earn a living. They were also concerned correctly about the debt and deficit that confronts this country. Those were the two items that they were very focused on and concerned about, and I think almost everybody on this floor shares their concerns. I got no message from any voter that I ought to come to Congress and undermine the air, water, land that they survive on, recreate on, and rely on for the quality of their lives. Not one constituent, whether they voted for me or against me, said, undermine the protections of our land and water and air. Not one. However, that is what we're dealing with today. Not jobs, not deficit, but undermining the integrity of our air, our water, and our land. I rise, therefore, Mr. Speaker, in strong opposition to this bill, which puts some of our nation's most precious natural resources at severe risk. This bill slashes funding for the Environmental Protection Agency by nearly 20 percent after a year in which its funding already declined by 16 percent. The result of these cuts will be an agency unequipped now, Mr. Speaker, I know I have to address you, but if I didn't, have, under the rules, have to address you, I'd address all of America about their concerns about this undermining of the Environmental Protection Agency. Americans want the environment protected. They don't want that effort undermined. It will mean higher risks of dirtier air, unsafe water, and carbon pollution in our atmosphere. No American said that that's what they wanted when they talked to me. This bill also includes a rider that would defund the listing of endangered species and habitats, a true failure of environmental stewardship. Perhaps worst of all, this bill comes with 39 separate anti-environment riders that cater to some of our nation's most powerful special interests. Now, maybe I missed it. Maybe there's an American somewhere who said, look, protect the special interest and undermine our environment. But, gee, I just missed talking to them, maybe. Maybe that was it. These riders would endanger and exploit our public resources, including such treasures as the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River, the quality of our nation's air and water for the private, private gain of just a few. The Land and Water Conservation Fund, which reinvests money we can gain from offshore oil and gas drilling into protecting our public lands. Now, we have just seen a dramatic assault on our lands on the Gulf Coast. It's cut 78 percent from the current year's funding in this bill. Communities waiting for funding for new sewer and drinking water systems will find a 40 percent cut from current levels. No American asked me for that. In 1995, the very first vote, the new Republican majority, 
1995, the very first vote that the new Republican majority cast on a bill like this one, one that attempted to slash the EPA and enact a wish list of special interest priorities. The year is different, but the policy is the same. But there was one major difference. That failed bill had just 17 environmental writers, less than half of this one. This one has 39. These provisions do nothing to control spending. They are end runs simply around laws to protect our environment. Now, as then, the wish list deserves to be voted down. Sherry Bullard, who was a member of the Natural Resources Committee, stood on this floor when that 1995 bill was offered. A Republican leader in the House of Representatives said, do not do this to our land, our air, and our water. Let me close by quoting the wise words of the ranking member of the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, my colleague and friend, Congressman Jim Moran, and I quote, there are those who want to make this controversy between humans and the environment, but that is a false assertion. I urge you to read the balance of Mr. Moran's quote in opposing this bad bill. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, what, for what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. H.R. 2584 is without question and without precedent the most regressive, destructive, and shameless attack on, on, envir on our environmental protections, this country's public health, and conservation in over four decades. This is accomplished through the backdoor changes that 40 ideologically driven policy writers in the legislation and is easily the biggest payout to polluters and special interests who helped craft these writers and, and, and who are now adding those to our laws. And this also accomplished on the writers, writers on an appropriation bill that legislate. It's also accomplished through defunding agencies, such as the EPA, so that their oversight is weakened and their enforcement becomes non-existent. Give away in public lands. These mechanisms are used in this legislation to not only undermine, but to dismantle protections that have been part of the legacy of this nation for years upon years and decade upon decade. Matters of life and death to the American people, clean air and clean water are left without funding to protect American families. The, and the legislation before us does not create jobs. If the reason of the deficit reduction, the reason that this is being done, as we hear from the other side, is for deficit reduction, that sounds hollow and contrived when one measures the cost of public health and cleanup that awaits the taxpayer in the very near future. It sounds hollow when the taxpayer sees the tax breaks, the public resource giveaways, and unregulated privileges to industry and big business. It seems hollow when the average American taxpayer suffers both the financial and human cost of this legislation. Let me use one example of a writer introduced uh, by my colleague from Arizona, a son of Arizona, uh, to the Grand Canyon. This would effectively defund any opportunity to study, to analyze the consequences of uranium mining on one million acres around the Grand Canyon. If anything else were to be an important point for this Congress, it is the icon of all our national parks, the Grand Canyon. And, and the uranium mining in that area has caused damage to people and the environment for years upon years. And now, with this rider, we are perpetuating the same climate, the same strategy that has caused the problems in the area. We are jeopardizing the water, the Colorado River, and water users in Nevada, California, and Arizona. And they use, they use an expert. They tout an expert as of today and recently, a person who rationalized that there will be no real damage to the Grand Canyon. Isn't it ironic and somewhat interesting to note that this expert is, 
sitting on 30 or more mining claims in the withdrawal area around the Grand Canyon and would stand to do very, very well financially upon sale and resale of these claims. This is the expert. This legislation, 2584, is a feeding frenzy for polluters, big oil and speculators who make their huge profits by cutting corners, ignoring regulations, and skirting the responsibilities we all have to follow the law. Now their mission has an eager partner, the majority of the House of Representatives. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this legislation and to protect the health of the American people and the health of our legacy as a nation. And I Jim, yield back. Jim yields back. For what purpose, Jim from Ohio, rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Jim is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, as, as we uh, sit and endure this mini filibuster about how horrible Republicans are when it comes to this bill and the environment, I want to give a perspective about how some of these writers actually got in the bill. Uh, I and a number of my colleagues uh, have spent a lot of time talking with this EPA, this EPA administrator, and it's like talking to this lectern. Nothing gets through. And I want to bring to your attention one particular uh, matter that I put in this bill that's a writer, and it has to do with the U.S. EPA Draft Notice 2010X. And that was a notice that went out to uh, the manufacturers of lawn fertilizer. Now, everybody in the chamber would agree that the uh, people who manufacture lawn fertilizer, what they put in the bag should be safe, it should uh, not harm the environment, uh, and it should actually do what it's supposed to do, and that's grow grass or, or, or do something else. However, the EPA, because they had precious little to do, decided that they weren't content with regulating what was uh, in the bag, they want to regulate what's on the bag, and not the list of ingredients, but what the, what the product is called. And so draft regulation 2010X, says that these companies need to reevaluate their trademark names, some of them that have been in effect since the 1960s, and remove those that the EPA uh, determines are misleading to the public. Now, I sat down with Ms. Jackson, the administrator of the EPA. I went over this. She sort of smiled and said, you know what, this really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I brought it up in subcommittee last year uh, and withdrew it at the request of the then majority. said they'd work on it. Well, it's still here. And here's a list of the words that they determine that you can't use if you're in the lawn fertilizer business. Germ shield, 100% protection, professional, professional grade, pro, safe, safer, safest, natural, environmentally safe, and green. Now, hold on a minute. There's a company in Ohio, it's not in my district, full disclaimer, but it's called Scott's. I bet a lot of people use Scott's product, and they make a product called Turf Builder. They also make a product called Turf Builder Pro. This draft notification tells them they can't call it pro anymore because it's misleading to the public. Even though the word pro was installed uh, to create a brand that small uh, uh, hardware stores could sell so you didn't have to go to the big boxes, the Walmarts, the Kmarts, and, and those other companies. So it's a niche brand for smaller retailers. But you can't call it that anymore. You can't call a bag of lawn fertilizer claim that it does anything green unless that green applies to livability and sustainability. Now, Mr. Speaker, when I was growing up, Mr. Chairman, when I was growing up, green was a color. This folder was green. Not anymore. Not anymore. If I can't demonstrate that this folder has something to do with livability and sustainability, I am misleading the people that are watching this program. Now, there's another company in Ohio that's over in Toledo, Miss Captures District. It's called, they have a product called Anderson's Golf Pro. And they have indicated, the EPA, that they're not allowed to call it Golf Pro anymore because you don't have to use the seed and the weed and seed on a golf course. You could use it, Mr. Chairman, on your front lawn. So they have to call it Anderson's Pro. Well, wait a minute, they can't call it Pro anymore either because that's misleading. So they can call it Anderson's and hope you can figure out what you're supposed to do with it. I told my friends at Scott's, I said, you know, you have really barely scratched the surface on this thing because the product that Scott's manufactures that I like so much is miracle Grow. Now, can you imagine, Mr. Speaker, how is the EPA going to be able to certify when I put that miracle grow on my tomato plant that a miracle has occurred? You're going to put a tremendous burden on the Vatican. All these little old ladies are going to be at the airport flying over to Rome to talk to the College of Cardinals and say, did a miracle occur? That's why some of these writers are in here. You have to be able to talk to people. And if they won't talk to you, you have to take action, as is contemplated by the Constitution, as a co-equal branch of the government. We've done that, and I'm, I'm sorry that it offends some of our colleagues, and I yield back.
Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? I move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when Americans think of America, they think of our great resources. Now, for big oil, that probably means the oil that's found on public lands and off our shores where they can get it for a song and charge a fortune. But for most Americans, it's the spacious skies and purple mountain majesties. And this bill, this legislation that we're considering here now, has no appreciation for America's priceless resources. According to the League of Conservation Voters, though, going farther than just beautiful vistas or purple mountain majesties, this bill is the biggest, in their words, biggest assault on the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the wildlife and wild places we hold dear ever to come before Congress. Continuing the Clean Water Network or the American Lung Association or the American Public Health Association or Physicians for Social Responsibility, they go, all go on to point out that the budget cuts or policy writers in this legislation undermine the laws that protect public health and reduce health care costs because we will lose the preventions that help reduce adverse health outcomes. It will lead to greater exposure that is cancerous, asthma attacks, strokes, emergency department visits. It is not just for the beauty of this country, although that might be reason enough to try to preserve all these things. It is for the health of America's people. This legislation would put children's health at risk. At the same time that it would be exempting oil companies from complying with clean air standards. We cannot tolerate this. Unregulated discharge of pesticides into our waterways, withholding funding for wild lands, allowing uranium mining on the, all around the Grand Canyon. Mr. Chairman, this is an unprecedented attack. And not just on those things I've mentioned, not just on life-saving public health protections and essential pollution control, it's an attack on science as well. This bill includes reductions in funding for the U.S. Geological Survey, research in climate and land use, scientific research, monitoring, modeling, forecasting. Let me give an example. The Landsat 7 satellite, just in the past month, has been used to track the largest fire in Arizona's history. Yet because of the cuts that would come to pass through this legislation, the data coming from the Landsat system would go unrecorded, unanalyzed, unused. Talk about false economy. And it's an unprecedented attack on our public lands. The largest cut in the Land and Water Conservation Fund that most of the members of this House have seen in their service. And I must say that's particularly important to a state like mine, New Jersey. My constituents reside in the most densely populated state in the Union. And yet they've demonstrated again and again with their votes their support for open space preservation, for fighting sprawl, for providing their kids, our kids, with safe places to experience the outdoors. Mr. Chairman, there is a long list of questions and you'll, a long list of reasons, and you'll be hearing still more about why this is terrible legislation. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Massachusetts rise? The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I rise in strong opposition to the underlying bill, H.R. 2584. 
and am disappointed that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are using this appropriations process to put at risk the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, our public lands, and our public health. For example, this bill would dismantle the Clean Water Act, which would not only undermine our constituents' access to clean and healthy waterways, but also would mean the loss of tens of thousands of jobs. My district, the 5th District of Massachusetts, is home to dozens of remarkable rivers and streams, which are a key part of the history, culture, economy, and natural beauty of the 5th District. Most of our rivers have excellent water quality, and it is common on warm days to see people swimming, fishing, and paddling. But our rivers were not always so hospitable. There was a time when the Merrimack River, one of the largest watersheds in New England, and the river that flows through my hometown of Lowell, was a depository for waste and pollution. For 150 years, the Merrimack River was one of the 10 most polluted rivers in the country. It was the Clean Water Act enforcement of the early 1970s that changed the future of our rivers. Because of the act and the enforcement authority afforded the EPA, a cleanup plan was put in place and polluters and violators were held responsible. Slowly, the Merrimack and surrounding rivers were monitored and improved to meet the clean water standards we take for granted today. This is just one oh so fortunate example, but replicated all across our country to our great good fortune and that of our children and grandchildren. While some states may adequately protect their waters on their own, not all do. And that is why Congress has given the EPA the authority to protect our waterways under the Clean Water Act. We must continue to strengthen safeguards for rivers and streams to ensure that all across the country, Americans enjoy the benefit of clean, safe water. I urge my colleagues to reject the short-sighted proposal to undercut the Clean Water Act and help protect America's clean water legacy. Thank you, and I yield back. What purpose does the gentlelady from Connecticut rise? The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I rise in strong opposition to a reckless and unconscionable interior appropriations bill put forward by the House Republican majority. Once again, they have put a radical, out-of-touch agenda and the desires of big oil and big polluters before the interests of the American people, the need to create jobs, and the health of our environment. This appropriations bill is more than just a danger to the health and safety of American families. It represents the worst assault on clean air and clean water in our nation's history. This legislation slashes funding for the Environmental Protection Agency by 18 percent. And the majority has shown time and time again that it opposes any environmental regulation that might hurt the bottom line of polluters. But it doesn't stop there. This legislation also slashes the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which helps states to finance wastewater system improvements by providing 55 percent of, of the resources, meaning that America's waterways will be put at risk of sewage and urban runoff pollution and good middle class jobs will be lost. And it cuts the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which protects national parks, forests, wildlife refuges from development by 78 percent. In addition, this partisan legislation includes at least 38 policy riders that for purely ideological reasons would harm American families and the environment. The bill would prohibit the EPA from implementing rules to protect communities from power plant pollution. It blocks the EPA from restoring clean water protections to more than half of our nation's streams and 20 million acres of wetlands, meaning the drinking water of 117 million Americans is put at risk. It blocks the EPA from moving forward on fuel efficiency standards that will reduce foreign oil imports and cut pollution. It blocks the EPA from regulating carbon pollution at power plants, refineries, and industrial sites. It even stops indefinitely long overdue standards to control air pollution from toxic mercury, endangering pregnant women, infants, and children. This legislation would open up more of our coastline to offshore drilling, one million acres of land around the Grand Canyon, a national treasure to toxic uranium mining. 
Mr. Speaker, there was a time when the Republican Party were known as defenders of the environment. It was a Republican President, Teddy Roosevelt, who inaugurated the National Forest Service and who worked to conserve 230 million acres of American land, including the Grand Canyon, which is now put at risk. He called the canyon, and I quote, a natural wonder, which is in kind absolutely unparalleled throughout the rest of the world. Leave, as, leave it as it is, he said. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it, end quote. It was a Republican president, Richard Nixon, who signed significant expansions of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, who brought life to the Environmental Protection Agency. Twenty years later, another Republican president, George Bush Sr., expanded the Clean Air Act even further to protect Americans' health. And yet today, a Republican majority brings us an interior appropriations bill which undoes all of this good work, which endangers American families, threatens to do permanent and irrevocable damage to the environment. I urge my colleagues in the majority, return to your roots, to once again put the American people before the interests of polluters and to oppose this disastrous legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lay yields back, uh, yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Uh, I move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I rise in opposition to the underlying bill. Instead of working on a bipartisan solution to address the looming default crisis or to create American jobs, today House Republicans have brought to the floor H.R. 2485, unprecedented legislation that would gut pollution controls and public health protections in order to give bigger profits to big oil and other special interest polluters. By attaching more than three dozen policy riders to this bill, the House GOP is attempting to use a spending bill to make backdoor changes to 40 years of federal laws that protect clean air, water, lands, and wildlife. The legislation would also cripple the budgets of key federal agencies charged with protecting American citizens and our natural resources. This is a new low for the 112th Congress, which has already seen the new House GOP majority attempt to gut the Clean Air Act, overturn the Clean Water Act, repeal cost-saving energy efficiency standards, and pull the plug on American jobs in clean energy innovation and manufacturing. Now this legislation would overturn 40 years of bipartisan progress protecting the American people and the environment. One area I choose to focus on is the continued attacks on the Clean Air Act, which have saved hundreds of thousands of lives and improved the health of Americans in every state. It protects the air we breathe and the water we drink. It protects our children from developing asthma and our seniors from developing emphysema. According to the American Lung Association, in 2010 alone, the Clean Air Act saved over 160,000 lives. Since 1990, the EPA estimates the Clean Air Act prevented an estimated 843,000 asthma attacks, 18 million cases of respiratory illness among children, 672,000 cases of chronic bronchitis, 21,000 cases of heart disease, and 200,000 premature deaths. It is clear that the Republican majority is doing all it can to stop EPA from carrying out its mission of protecting public health and protecting the environment. Many will claim that the EPA is moving at a faster pace than any other administration in history. However, the EPA has proposed fewer Clean Air Act rules under President Obama over the past 24 months than in the first two years of either President Bush or President Clinton. That is why in December of 2010, 280 groups, including the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, the American Public Health Association, and others sent a letter urging the Congress to reject any measure that would block or delay the United States Environmental Protection Agency from doing its job to protect all Americans from life-threatening air pollution. This bill, an appropriation bill, is not the place to legislate these types of changes. These should be policy changes not made during this process. The Clean Air Act is promoting innovation and in breaking Americans' oil in, uh, dependence, but Republicans would give big polluters a loophole to roll back our clean energy progress and continue our addiction to foreign oil. The Clean Air Act is good for the economy. Many studies have shown that the Clean Air Act's economic benefits far exceed any costs associated with the law by as much as 40 to 1 ratio. 
As President Obama so eloquently spoke of during his State of the Union address, we must out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build our global competitors and win the future. Rolling back a law that protects the air our children breathe to allow oil companies, companies that are already reaping record profits, the ability to spew chemicals, smog, soot, and pollution into the air just to please a lobbyist or a big oil corporation is irresponsible and, yes, extreme. The Clean Air Act has been on the books for decades with positive results for our economy, our environment, and our businesses. Rolling back these protections will hurt our most vulnerable. We simply cannot afford to go backward. And with that, I thank you and yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, the Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill before us today represents an all-out assault on clean air, clean water, and land conservation efforts in our country. To be clear, passage of this measure is an absolute abandonment of this body's responsibility to provide for the general welfare of the United States. This bill seriously undermines the significant advances that we've made as a country as responsible stewards of our land and natural resources, our wildlife, our air, and our water. And perhaps most importantly, this legislation is a threat to the health and well-being of all Americans. Some have argued that the riders attached to this bill are sensible in an attempt to rein in what they call the excesses of the Environmental Protection Agency and job-killing regu regulations. This is an absurd claim. This legislation is nothing more than a complete caving in to special interests and in big oil and some of our nation's worst polluters. For the people I represent in the 1st Congressional District of Rhode Island, the stunning reductions to the EPA and the related policy riders that strike against the gains we've made to clean air and clean water are a threat to public health and the environment. Let me give you one example, Mr. Chairman. According to reports from the Rhode Island Clean Water Action, Rhode Island has the third highest rate of childhood asthma in the Northeast and the fifth highest nationally. The state spends $316 million providing health care for problems attributed to particulate matter every year. What's more, 27,000 Rhode Island children currently suffer from asthma. The average length of a hospitalization stay for children with asthma in Rhode Island is two days, with an average cost of $7,840. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle need to realize that the drastic reductions and the anti-environment riders in this bill threaten not only our air and water quality, but have real and negative economic consequences on real people, on real families, increasing health care costs, generating additional lost days of work and productivity, and inciting detrimental long-term health and developmental consequences for our children. In addition, this bill slashes vital infrastructure funding that's not only essential to protecting our environment and public health, but also create jobs and support state and local economic development opportunities. This bill sets the Clean Water State Revolving Fund at 55% or $833 million below the FY 2011 level. The bill sets the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund 14% below the fiscal year 2001 le level, and that's a cut of $134 million. I'd like to read an excerpt from the 2010 annual report of the Rhode Island Clean Water Finance Agency, the entity charged with administering federal and state programs relating to municipal wastewater and drinking water financial assistance. A revolving fund allows for the perpetual availability of funds to assist local governmental units in meeting water quality goals by providing loans and other forms of financial assistance. Our primary goals are to provide low-cost means to reduce pollution caused by wastewater, help provide safe drinking water, and to provide low-interest loans to cities and towns to help citizens repair failed, failing, or substandard septic systems. Undeniably, at this moment, we're working to rein in our public debt. We have to be smart about the investments we make. Just consider the mission of this state agency whose efforts are supported through the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds to provide low-cost means to reduce pollution caused by wastewater and to provide safe drinking water. These are fundamental objectives to safeguard the health and well-being of Rhode Islanders and of men, women, and children all across this country. And what's the response to our friends on the other side of the aisle in this Congress to cut these vitally important infrastructure programs by more than a billion dollars? 
If this Congress wants to be serious about reigning and spending, we can no longer try to fool ourselves with the misguided belief that critical infrastructure projects, especially those supported through state revolving funds that protect our health and environment, are going to miraculously become less expensive with time. Reducing federal funds that help support these kinds of projects to improve our water and wastewater systems will only incite deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance only makes future projects more expensive and in many instances will increase the likelihood of infrastructure failures that threaten public health and the environment and impede economic growth. These will undoubtedly cost us more in the long run. Some have called this bill the worst assault on clean air and clean water in history. I strongly urge my colleagues to reject this assault on the health, welfare, and economic vitality of our states, our cities, and our towns. Let us not be known as the Congress who betrayed our solemn responsibility to be good stewards of the earth. I urge my colleagues to reject this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? I'm going to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I move uh, to strike the last word. Having set sail in search of new shores for pirating and profiteering, it's quite apparent that the GOP is lost at sea under the helm of a confused, misguided leadership. Under the guise of austerity and deficit reduction, they have plotted our nation on a fateful course that will only result in the surging of torrents of sewage, untreated chemicals and other hazardous materials into our rivers, streams, and creeks, along with factories, plants, and refineries belching smoke, smog, and mercury into our blue skies. Sick children and the aged who suffer from asthma, respiratory illnesses, they'll get sicker and sicker while oil and gas companies and mining companies get fatter and fatter. Mr. Chair, I see, as I see it, this bill is nothing more than an attempt to remove 40 years of federal laws that protect our air, water, land, and wildlife only in a Republican-controlled house would we increase access to oil and gas leases while reducing our ability to ensure drilling operations are environmentally safe? Only in a Republican-controlled House would we reduce the ability of states to safely manage their sewage and wastewater runoff. And Mr. Speaker, only in a Republican-controlled Congress would we allow more uranium mining near the Grand Canyon. Mr. Speaker, these efforts are opposed by the majority of Americans who believe in oversight of drilling operations, protection from tainted drinking water, and those who believe that the Grand Canyon, with all of its majestic beauty, should be a natural, national treasure for the enjoyment of families and tourists not a wasteland laid bare by mining companies whose insatiable appetites for profit is equaled only by the magnitude of the damage they would inflict upon our environment. These aren't the rants and raves of liberal environments, environmentalists hell-bent on protecting nature at all costs. These are the sentiments of red-blooded Americans who believe that our natural resources, like the Grand Canyon, improve our quality of life. The American people don't want progress if progress means that our skies get darker, our water gets murkier, murkier, and they don't want our wildlife to go extinct. But clearly that will be the effect of this bill should this ill-gotten measure pass. Mr. Speaker, day after day, week after week, and month after month, House Republicans hand out life preservers to special interests while kicking the American people overboard like the bundled tea 
kicked overboard by the real Tea Partiers at the start of the American Re Revolution. Sure, our children have asthma, but big business gets to pump more pollution into our air. Sure, our water is tainted, but special interests get to dump runoff in our streams. Yes, our indeed endangered species are slowly fading away, but now we can drill in their habitats. What happens, Mr. Speaker, when our air becomes too dirty to breathe, when our water becomes too dirty to drink, and when our wildlife all go extinct? I urge a no vote on this bill, but before I close, I'd like to remind my colleagues across the aisle that the captain always goes down with the ship. And that's the real deal. Gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas rise? Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Colleagues, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, I just wanted to start by acknowledging the loss of our valiant uh, Capitol Police. Uh, Jacob, Officer Jacob J. Chestnut and Detective John M. Gibson, of which we're honored today and just wanted to acknowledge the men and women of the United States Capitol Police uh, for their service and my sympathy again to the families of Officer Chestnut and Detective uh, John M. Gibson. I also wanted to make note <clears throat> of my worshiping with the Norwegian Siemens Church yesterday in Houston and let the Norwegian people and the people of Norway of course know that America stands with them during this very difficult time. I thought it was appropriate to acknowledge those tragedies uh, because it is a time when we have had to come together and I also believe that as we look at where we are today uh, there should be an opportunity for us to be able to come together. So I'm disappointed in this legislation because it, it really does not seem to uh, call us to do that. I want to remind uh, America and my colleagues that we are 50 states, but there are times when we act on behalf of our states and district, but there are times when it is important to exist as a single nation. One single state did not defend the nation after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. We came together. One state on its own, or one region, did not end segregation and establish civil rights. We did it together. There are times when the stakes are so high that we simply must unite. And so I raise the question of where are we with this bill that seems to attack both clean air and clean water by repealing requirements that prevent pesticides sprayed from chemical companies from entering rivers and streams. I come from the energy sector and I believe that the energy sector creates jobs. I also believe that we can be a good neighbor, strong in our domestic development and production, but also concerned about clean air. When you listen to those who have worked in this area for so long, you hear opposition from the Wilderness Society that says this is an extreme assault on America's bedrock environmental protection, the Clean Water Network that says these severe spending and budgetary cuts in this bill includes not only cuts but a series of policy riders really having no place in the appropriations process. And the American Lung Association, the American Public Health Association, Physicians for Social Responsibility, budget cuts and or policy riders would impact EPA's ability to do their job. I don't know if our members realize that in 2011, we cut 16% from the EPA. Now we want to cut 18%, over $1.5 billion. That cripples the very agency that is protect our water and our air protect our children and our elderly. What is the response to our responsibility to be the custodians of this wonderful nation? What a beautiful country we have. And then to hear that another one-third is being cut from the National Landscape 
uh, and uh, conservation systems that does monuments and trails in our wild rivers. How many families pack up in times that are hard and take those family members on a road trip to travel the beauty of this nation, the tall mountains, the deep valleys, and the wonderful rivers? Well, let me tell you what this legislation will do. It will be a bill with litany of additional cuts important for programs that cut climate change prevention programs, the Fish and Wildlife, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It is a program that, in essence, assaults what we're trying to do here in America. How many friends know that we have had over 230,000 deaths each year because of the lack of regulating toxins in the air? Or, uh, let me correct that and say that we've been able to prevent 230,000 deaths each year by regulating toxins in the air. We've already heard my colleagues come to the floor of the House and talk about the rising increase in many cities of asthma. So let me make it very clear. We want to create jobs. I've joined together where we can deregulate and de-entangle the regulations that would keep us from creating jobs. But I also believe that when it comes to protecting the nation's assets, we join together as Republicans and Democrats. I remind you that none of this creates jobs. I remind you that we've already engaged in these cuts. Isn't it interesting that in regular order, we're now doing, even though there is disagreement, what our friends on the other aisle said they can't do. That's why they're not raising the debt ceiling. Six, but I will tell you that these draconian cuts, along with this draconian uh, debate on the debt ceiling, General's is what ladies, is going time to is undermine expired. America. Who seeks recognition? Let's stand as Americans. What I yield purpose back. does the gentlelady from California rise? Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word. I want to speak in strong opposition to this reckless bill and the abundance of extraneous and irresponsible provisions that it contains. Right now, we're down to the wire on defaulting on our debt. But instead of focusing on a way forward, the majority is offering up this ill-conceived piece of legislation, a bill that is polluted, and I emphasize polluted, with unrelated and inappropriate riders that do not belong in a spending bill. The reality is that these riders will have very little impact on our national deficit, but they will have a huge and lasting effect on our health, our environment, and our natural resources. So why are these programs being targeted? Well, we've seen this before with H.R. 1 earlier this year, and we're seeing it again now. The majority is choosing to reward big oil and polluters at the expense of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the wildlife and wild places we hold dear. Mr. Chairman, it's not an exaggeration to say that this bill drastically undermines our government's ability to protect our environment. This bill jeopardizes the conservation and protection of places like the Channel Islands National Park in my congressional district and the wildlife this special place harbors, closing a quarter of national wildlife refuges across the country, affecting places like the Guadalupe Dunes near Santa Maria, Cali slashing cal support for federal programs that support our outstanding natural areas like the Piedras Blancas Light Station or the Carrizo Plain National monument in California, opening up protected and sensitive areas in California's national forests to off-road vehicle use, putting places like Los Padres National Forest at risk, and blocking the protection of wilderness quality lands. And as the bill stands, Mr. Chairman, it would bar new listings of threatened and endangered species as well as critical habitat designations. And it would gut the successful Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is our nation's principal source of federal funding to pre preserve irreplaceable lands and waters. Under this disaster of a bill, the LWCF would be reduced to the lowest level in its 45-year history, an 80% cut compared to last year's funding. And who will benefit from this cut? Not the American taxpayer, because this fund is paid for from offshore drilling revenues. Instead, communities will lose important conservation and recreation projects that create jobs and improve the quality of life for working and middle-class Americans. But this assault isn't limited to our lands and wildlife. This dirty legislation is also littered with riders that seek to get the protections of the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts. 
such as preventing the EPA from strengthening limitations on polluted storm water runoff, blocking the EPA's oversight on water use by power plants, impeding the clarification of which streams and wetlands are protected under the Act. Under the House spending plan, the clean water and drinking water state revolving funds will also see significant cuts. These are the funds established to st for states to complete water infrastructure projects, projects which create jobs and provide clean, safe drinking water. The riders in this bill, Mr. Chairman, are also an assault on the very air we breathe. They would prevent the EPA from limiting carbon pollution from power plants and other stationary sources, from updating limits on smog and mercury emissions. Our one rider would block the EPA from setting new mileage standards for cars and won't even allow the state of California to set its own standards. Surely we can think of better solutions to solve our fiscal problems rather than attacking our air, our water, and our lands. Sadly, this interior appropriations bill deeply undermines our important role of passing on an America whose land, water, and, and air are clean, healthy, productive, beautiful, and accessible for all to enjoy. I strongly urge my colleagues to vote no on this terrible, terrible bill. And I yield back the balance of my time.